last couple of weeks we've been talking about revival and uh, everything that's happening around us about revival and there's a lot of good stuff that you can listen to and watch my concern as your pastor is that uh, there's a balance to what you see and what you hear and what you believe and so today we're going to watch a uh, video from a pastor from Malaysia who is just reminding us what really what revival is all about and what it takes to be involved in revival. You hear a lot of people saying, oh, there's a tsunami coming and there's going to be a billion people saved and all these things. That's great. That's wonderful. It is going to happen. The question is when and at what price. And so this pastor has the maturity to talk about what it takes and what it's going to take. So, Stephen, can you uh, start the video, please? of the Pentecostal World Fellowship. We're talking about a man that is using Yeah, Leslie, why don't you come now and you can announce Tuesday briefly, please. Thank you, thank you. So I'm glad you gave me a heads up that I would be talking about this. And so I even did a little blurb about it. So on Tuesday evenings, uh, 7 o'clock here, I'm not sure what room, Probably in there. Okay, so we're going to meet together for, uh, let's say, a Bible study. And I've given it a name. And I've called it the Emmaus Enigma. So you have to come along and understand what that means. But also I've got a subtitle, The Divine Quest for Truth. The Divine Quest. And it's a divine quest. It's not just our searching for the divine it's the divine, the Lord, who is searching for us. And so, what I said is, we'll be looking at our lives as a journey to discover truth. It's a great adventure. Our lives are a great adventure. But also, we, have, we face great hindrances and challenges in our journey. Ultimately, we know that the truth is a person, Jesus Christ. And our primary resource will be the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. Along the way, we'll find that our ideas of truth are very often overturned. We'll also find that not only have we been searching for God, He has also been searching for us. We will also be looking at the current understandings of truth in our society and discovering how these ideas developed, how the secular world has come to think the way it does, and the great contrast between absolute and relative truth. This is so we might be better witnesses of the hope that's within us and the treasures of wisdom and understanding we have gained 
through the Holy Spirit that give hope not just in this life, but also in that which is to come. So that's sort of an overview, overview of my ideas uh, as we meet together. And so it'll be a time of sharing and I'll just be offering ideas for discussion and hopefully we get to know one another better and we can pray for one another and really grow in our understanding of the truth. And of course, that's the understanding of our Lord and Savior. Um, so I have these little um, blurbs. If you want one, I'll just leave them here. And if you want to talk to me afterwards about it more, that's fine as well. Thank you. Back to you, Joe. Are we ready? God Relief Agency is also the vice chairman of Asia Pacific General Superintendent Fellowship. And he is also vice chairman of the National Evangelical Christian Fellowship of Malaysia. He's an advisor counseling of the Pentecostal World Fellowship. We're talking about a man that is used influentially not only in Malaysia, but also in the world. So Reverend Ong, please let us hear your word. Thank you, Apostle. Uh, Patricia Francis, it's a joy to be able to share my heart with you and all of our esteemed speaker today. Now, the topic given to me is something that is very dear to me, and I, I really believe that God has something to say about how to trigger a revival. And as I begin to hear our dear brother speak just now, I affirm that there, there really is a globalized world system run by a cabal group of leaders, uh, and they, they are hidden and they will be manifested soon. And then the entire idea, the entire purpose of this cabal of world leaders is to bring a world government and also to subjugate and to destroy and to limit the influence of the church. That is why every time when we talk about changing a nation, we have to talk about the bride of Christ, the local church itself. I believe with all of my heart that earth is ready for an earth-shaking globalized revival like never before. We're living in a time where the church, the local church itself is shackled with materialism, a rebellion, ungodliness and as you can see in north america and it is spreading around the world in hong kong and and some of the asia pacific country anarchy and chaos is everywhere and we all know that god do not work through anarchy and chaos god is a god of peace god do not need anarchy and chaos but we know for sure that anarchy and chaos is the environment where human spirit and demonic spirit can can really thrive in and more than that, the church today in the Eastern world and the Western world is also under immense pressure. Persecution, we hear about persecution in Nigeria, in China. In China, they're openly tearing down churches and uh, not only persecution, the church is facing pressure like militant capitalism. And uh, one of the things I believe, and it's happening at least in Malaysia, that the world government is doing is to encroach into the financial affairs of the church. And all this is to subjugate and to really put us in a position where we are completely weakened. But praise God, God will strengthen his church. There is a revival, earth-shaking global revival that is coming, not only around the world, but also to Canada. As I begin to pray for Canada, I begin to see the map of Canada in my mind I can see fire springing all over Canada from the northwest and also to the northeast part of Canada. Fires begin to spring up uh, and, and, and those fire begin to come together and they begin to form a great bonfire that will engulf Canada. Canada, get ready. God is going to send a mighty revival. But every time when we talk about revival, we have to ask ourselves, why is revival not happening? Every one of us, if we are honest enough, if we mix around and fellowship around, we know everybody is talking about revival. But why is it not happening? What are some of the trigger that we must have to trigger a revival? 
first of all, we need to understand that for revival to come this time, I believe God wants to release what I will call a Jeremiah anointing, a Jeremiah prophetic anointing upon the church. Jeremiah is one of the most outstanding prophets in the Old Testament, and he's one of those prophets that have a very strong pastoral heart as well. In fact, I will call him a pastoral prophet. And he's, uh, he's a prophet of the heart. More than 66 times, the word heart is used in the book of Jeremiah. And every time when you talk about the church, the local church, that is where the pastoral is. And we need to address revival in the context of the local church before it can really spread out towards the entire world. Jeremiah 1 tells us in verse 1 and verse 2 that Jeremiah's prophetic ministry began in the 13th year of the king Josiah. Josiah was an outstanding king. He was a king that brought a lot of structural changes, a lot of uh, changes, reformation, religious reformation in the nation of Israel. But in spite of all the structural and religious reformation he had brought into the nation of Israel, like today's church, something was missing. The heart was missing. The heart was missing. That is why chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, Jeremiah was introduced in the 30th year, 13th, 30th year, 13th year of the prophet uh, of the king Josiah. Josiah had religious reformation structure, and a lot of our churches today have that kind of religious reformation good teaching and cultural engagement. But you see, you can have all that and yet not have the heart of the Lord and not understanding where our heart is. Obviously, there was no change in the heart of the people, although there were a lot of structural religious changes. Let me read one verse that sort of sum up the heart of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 the Bible says, for my people have committed specifically two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and heal themselves for themselves, system, broken system that can not hold any water. There are two things here, the two evils. Number one, they have forsaken the Lord. Number two, they have built for themselves system that could not heal, that could not hold water. You see, God does not only want to be loved by his people. God do not want to be substitute with anything else. God does not want the, the doctrinal strength, strength that we have today, and I believe in doctrine, to replace our heart for Jesus. God do not want our biblical structure to replace the heart of Jesus. And that was the main problem. We need that Jeremiah prophetic anointing to bring back the heart again and to evaluate the heart again. The second thing that we need to consider, uh, if you're going to see a, a great revival being triggered, is to understand that revival is not necessarily church growth. You can grow a church if you have the power. And everything runs on power. You can grow a church on the power of music, you can grow a church on the power of system, talents, eloquence, cultural connection that a lot of churches are involved in. But yet, when, when you have all those people, no lives are changed. Because only the power that comes from the Holy Spirit can change people's lives. That is why we need to understand a lot of church growth pastor. I'm a pastor of a growing church. We have a few thousand people here. And I'm here to tell you, not all of them are walking with God. Not all of them have, uh, have a heart for God. Not all of, the, all of them are being transformed. People come because they like the music. They like good preaching. They like good teaching. They like good structure. They like good environment. And all these are powerful. And you can grow the church that way, but only the power of the Holy Spirit can change people's lives. That is why we need a full bloom Holy Ghost revival. And then we need that Jeremiah anointing to probe beyond all those great doctrine and great 
structural reformation and those those essential cultural engagement and go to the heart of the issue, which is the heart of the people. Revival is not church growth. But what is revival? Sometimes as Pentecostal spirit, few people we use the word revival so uh, carelessly. But what is revival? Revival, according to the Hebrews revival in 1949, simply means when God come down from heaven. When God come down from heaven, it is a time of God's visitation accompanied with great conviction and supernatural power. That is revival. It has nothing to do with program. It is 100% God. It is God for the sake of, forgive me for the lack, uh, for the sake, for using the wrong word. It's just God stepping down from heaven, getting into the church, and beginning to do the thing that only he alone can do. And that is revival. Amen. What are the three keys to triggering a revival? Number one, we have to get ready the heart. There must be birth within every one of our members and our leaders, a spiritual frustration. A frustration that say that we are very, very far away in comparison to what biblical Christianity is all about. We have to stop giving excuses. We have to stop telling ourselves we, we do not have the right tools. We are in the wrong place. There must be a spiritual frustration. And afterwards, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray that God will put this spiritual frustration. And sometimes the frustration will be so bad that we will go before God and cry before God and break our hearts before God. Now, one of the favorite verses that is used uh, in revival preaching and teaching is 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14 have been prayed over, used, sung over, preached over and over again through hundreds of years, and yet we have not seen the amount of miracles that we want to see. Why? Because 2 Chronicles 7.14 is not a formula. It works only when a heart is frustrated when the heart realizes that something is wrong, even though we pray that scripture is not happening, something is wrong. So number one, we need to pray for spiritual frustration. Number two, we need to get ready to sacrifice. Now as a pastor, I can share with you with all honesty that revival will scare the living daylight out of a lot of people. I ask myself a question and you have to ask yourself a question. Do you really want it? Because let me tell you something about revival. Revival is very strenuous physically. We're living in a time today where we, we celebrate comfort. We try to live a balanced life, a balanced spiritual life. One of the most popular causes that is taught in society, in the corporate world, and even in the religious world today is life planning. But I want you to know when God stepped down from heaven, He's going to destroy your plans. Oh. Absolutely. Your plans may not be wrong, but when it's coming, it will destroy your plans. Are we ready to take the fiscal stream? Number two, revival is very messy. And let me tell you, I started a church when the church was only eight people. And now we have a few thousand people. And I'll tell you this, one of the main things that we do as pastor is to make sure that Churches and ministry are not messy. A, a casual study of revival in the Bible and even in contemporary history tells us that when God stepped down from heaven, everything is messy. At least in our estimation, everything becomes chaotic according to our interpretation. But it is not necessarily messy and chaotic for God. Are we ready? We are talking about having services for one and a half hours and now in many churches one hour 15 minutes and people are telling me today you know if we ever go back to our church and worship again in the church building the, the service should not be one and a half hours because they are so used to one hour 15 minutes online services it's going to be very very messy <laughs> other price we have to pay is the unpredictable unpredictable unpredictableness of Revival. You don't know what is going to happen. 
And finally, revival is very controversial. We don't want to be controversial. We want to be astute. We want to give the impression that we are well studied, well prepared, think everything through. But revival is always controversial. There will be a mixture of human spirit, demonic spirit, and also, of course, definitely God's spirit. You will see all kinds of manifestations. It's going to be very controversial. It's going to be a mixed bag of experience. We must ready our sacrifice. And this is something we need to seriously pray for our pastors and leaders to be ready for sacrifice. And finally, we must ready the man. The lightning rod of revival is that man and that woman. And when you look into the life of Jeremiah, you find that Jeremiah was a man that is very, very broken. In fact, he's so broken that at times, he even go to the extent of blaming God. In one scripture, he called God an unreliable stream. He complained to God as to how God treated him. If we are going to be the lightning rod of God, if our churches, if our pastors are going to be used by God, then we must be ready to be broken, going through painful emotional, mental experiences, financial experiences, because God can only use a man that is broken and a man who has a contrite spirit. As a Bible school student, as, as pastors, like many of us, we, we take a lot of pain to learn how to lead. But the greatest and the most important gift in time of revival is not the gift to lead. It is the gift to follow. And many churches today are led by men and women like yourself, myself, and we, we learn leadership. And it's, we must be ready to surrender leadership. Because if you study revival in history, no one particular revival is the same. Some revival have a lot of preaching, some have little preaching, some revival have a lot of singing, some have little singing, but every revival definitely have a lot of praying. So the man must be ready. A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. This is not very exciting, I know, but it is true. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. We need a powerful revival. We need more than spiritual experience. We are under so much pressure. The tide of the enemy is so strong. We need God to come down from heaven, resuscitate us, give us that extra. We need more than spiritual discipline. We need more than discipleship program. We need an experience called revival. And then when revival comes, God will come down from heaven and God will give us everything that we need. And then with that revival, we'll be able to leave a legacy for the future. We were able to leave a foundation of blessing and a legacy of righteousness and holiness for the future generation. Let us pray that God will really send a, a powerful revival in heaven. Father, I pray right now, especially for Canada. Lord, I see revival springing up all over Canada. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you prepare this great nation on this great day, Canada Day, Lord, that you will pour out your spirit in an unprecedented way. I pray in the name of Jesus that there will be a hunger for revival. I pray, oh God, that you will raise up men and women, oh God, who are willing to pay the price of spiritual frustration, the price of spiritual frustration. And when that frustration comes into their heart, oh Father, that they will not try to find a quick relief for it, but they will allow that frustration to work in them and to drive them into your presence, into your word, into prayer and fasting. And out of that frustration, I pray they will pray, Second Chronicles 7, 14, and they will seek your face. 
and not only your hands, dear God. I pray, oh God, that you prepare, oh God, Canada, the church in Canada, oh God, to be ready to sacrifice. Lord, Canada is a very pro a progressive nation. The church in Canada is well learned, well, well trained, and well, and, 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 and the church in Canada are led by men and women of a great experience. I thank you, Lord, for every one of them, but I pray none of their experiences, oh God, will stop them from experiencing you in revival fire like never before. I pray, oh God, that, that churches all around Canada, oh God, will be ready. I pray the pastor will get the church ready. The pastor will be ready to work harder and longer. And the pastor will have the mindset to handle the unpredictability of revival. We have the wisdom to handle and move and, and guide the church during the time of messiness of revival. And I pray, oh God, that pastors will die to their own personal reputation because I know when you come in revival power, there will be controversy that they will surrender their reputation, oh God, and hand it to you and believe that you will be, oh God, the one who will safeguard their reputation. I pray, oh God, that you will raise up men and women all over Canada, oh God, men and women that is sold out for revival, oh God, men and women, oh Father, that will have that passion that they, men and women that were driven, they will be driven to prayer. And men and women, they will never be satisfied, even though they have a big church and great ministry, until they see a mighty manifestation of revival power, oh God. Until unless they have come to a place that they can say, I have seen the glory of God manifested in my day, touching my generation and preparing and laying a foundation for the future generation. So Lord, I commit Canada into him. Bless Canada. And, and Canada, the Lord your God will even say this day to you, in the next six months, get ready. You have been protected. You have been hatched by protection. But in the next six months, the enemy will try to rock the nation of Canada. In the next six months, the Lord will even say this day to you, you have to rise up in greater prayer and intercession. You have always, you have always been a nation that share with others. You have always been a nation that receive from others. And the Lord is glorified to you. And the Lord is pleased. But the Lord say, Canada, you need to rise up right now to put an armor, put on the armor of a soldier. You need to rise and put the armor of a mighty soldier. For the enemy is coming after you. But the Lord will even say this day to you that if you if you were to hearken unto this prophetic word, and if you were to stand up and begin to pray against the tide of evil, and pray against the tide of worldliness that is going to try to penetrate your nation, even your government in the next six months, the Lord will raise up a standard against it, and the Lord will destroy the powers of the enemy, that the enemy will have no hold over your nation. For the Lord watches over you, Canada, and the Lord will bless you, and the Lord will use you to continue to bless other nations through the preaching of the gospel and releasing of the glory of God from where you are to the entire earth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Just so you know, I endorse that. I stand with him when it comes to revival. I stand with what he said. Many of you have heard about Jack Hayford. He describes the gift of a glory that came to his congregation. And I'm only going to read part of the chapter. But what happened was, um, one day he was in the sanctuary and all of a sudden he saw a mist. And he wondered what it was. And the Lord spoke, it is what you think it is. 
The word struck me as moving and humorous at the same moment. The Almighty God of the universe saw me worrying about and confirming witness of what was happening and condescended to be that witness himself. It was as though God were saying, I see it too, Jack. That was the humorous part. That moved me deeply were the words that followed. I have given my glory to dwell in this place. It's just like the pastor said. God made a decision in his sovereignty to come down from heaven and dwell in Jack Hayford's church. I stood watching silently, and moments later, the scene returned to the ordinariness of mere sunlight in the room. Strangely, I felt inclined to do nothing unusual. I remember thinking, thank you, Lord. But otherwise, I was relatively unresponsive. I didn't fall down in worship. I didn't feel I should take my shoes off. I didn't sense any dominant emotion of any kind. I knew only that I didn't sense any uh, I knew only that I had seen what I had seen and heard what I had heard. I went on home and said nothing of the vision to anyone for some time. But the implications of that afternoon were soon to be realized. Looking back, I would realize it was clearly a moment of enormous consequence. It was a Kairos moment. The next day, listen to this. The next day, instead of the usual hundred or so in attendance, there were 160 worshipers in the morning service. So from one week to another, his congregation goes from 100 to 160. 60 people show up. This is what he said. There had been no special emphasis, no promotional campaign, no advertising, nothing. Except that day, before God had said, he was giving a gift. So, it was years before I shared publicly the story of that afternoon because I realized it could be sorely misunderstood. But from that day, there was, has been an extraordinary ongoing work of grace among us. Lives have been changed, bodies healed, homes rescued, people delivered, truth perceived, love outpoured. It's just like the pastor said, right? When God comes down, things start to happen. Jack didn't do anything. He didn't have to do anything. God did it. God decided lives would be changed, bodies healed, homes rescued, people delivered, truth perceived, loved outpoured. That's what was important. And what else happened? And our numerical growth has been remarkable from the few saints prior to the second day of 1971 until this writing in 1982, when more than 4,300 gather each Sunday morning. The first lesson is that God does desire to manifest his glory among his people. That's what Jack learned. And that's what the pastor's talking about. God wants to manifest his glory among his people. Second lesson we learn from the day is that his glory attends those who worship him in his way. His glory comes to those who worship him in his way. The third lesson we learned is that God's glory in the midst of the people may be lost. The third lesson we learned is that God's glory in the midst of a people may be lost. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit is grieved. 
and the Holy Spirit goes silent and the Holy Spirit withdraws. And Jesus comes in, walks down the aisle, picks up his menorah, and walks out. And the church dies. To the church in Laodicea, I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. To the church at Ephesus, and just so you know, the Church of Ephesus was a leading church in this time. There is no more church in Ephesus. You go to Ephesus today, you can't find a church. There is no church. This is what Yeshua said. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from this place. So praise God for who he is, eh? Praise God for his forgiveness. Praise God for who he is. And uh, Jack Hayford would tell you, revival can come in different ways. And nobody knows how it's going to come. So what would happen? Are we getting prepared? What would happen if... 30 new people showed up here next week. Yes. I was just saying, be brief. Uh, faith the size of a mustard seed, and you can move a universe or something, extrapolate. Um, not by might, not by power, but by God's spirit. Another one is the whole universe. If it was the size of a dime, what creates it from outside, if that was that spirit, is like bigger than the whole universe, if all the universes were the size of a dime. So Stephen's going to send that video to all of you, everybody that isn't here, and I encourage you to watch it again. And uh, because when the Lord shows up, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. It'll be on the website, but it's going to go to all of you personally, email. And I request that you watch it again and pray. He said revival starts with prayer. And, uh, yeah. So, just so you know, this is the best tape I've seen on revival. I've seen a lot. This is one the one I chose to show you. <laughs> 